I need to make the same disclaimer that uh, Dale did for slightly different reasons. I worked for as a federal employee for 38 plus years. Last couple of years I've uh, worked part time after retiring from the government. I'm a contractor, so I'm not speaking for the government. Uh, another big difference between almost all the talks uh, to this point and this afternoon is I'm talking about history. I'm not talking about the future. Uh, I'm talking about the deployment that DREN has done. In a moment, I'll have a sl slide that will show you what DREN did. I've got about three sections in this talk. The first section is what we've done. And I'll, when I'm through with those few slides, I'll pause and ask if there's any questions. Second section is how we did it. And when I'm through with that section, I'll ask if there's any questions. And then the third section is lessons learned. And feel free at any point during that part to ask any questions that you might have. OK. You have to understand that Department of Defense is a big organization. They have a large research community. In our case, 4,000 people plus that use a series of computers scattered across the country, high performance computers, and that's what the HPC MP stands for. DRAN is part of that program. We're the network that ties all those computers to all the users. The users are scattered in 20 some states across the country and a few in foreign places. But what we've done with IPv6, and I said this was history, we did it from 2003 to 2005. We took the, the HPC centers and several user sites. We deployed IPv6 across the infrastructure of those sites. The systems, the, route, the network infrastructure, selected applications, the desktops, you know, soup to nuts. And then the entire network, the whole backbone is dual stack enabled. We didn't turn it off, do a couple of tests and, and we didn't turn it on, do a couple of tests, turn it off. We turned it on, it stayed on 24 seven. And we took one mission, core mission application. In our case, that's Kerberos. It does all of our authentication, all of our remote computer access and all our file transfer between our distributed user base and those supercomputers over DREN. We t speak of DREN, oh, also Defense Research Engineering Network, before I forget, you can either say DREN or DREN, depending on the coast that you're from. And I categorically deny that if you take the acronym and spell it backwards, you know where the acronym came from, OK? Our user base scattered across the country. Uh, uh, for about 40% of them are on site at the same locations where the supercomputing centers are. And that's important for some of the things that we did later. The rest of them are scattered out across the country. Some of them are at military installations, some of them are at universities, some of them are at commercial facilities, uh, industrial facilities. Now, our first two goals back in 2003, remember I'm talking history, was to end-to-end -end enable the entire wide area network. At that time, it was 100 plus sites. It's grown to over 200 today. And we wanted to maintain our performance and our security levels that existed prior to installing IPv6. Uh, it's a high, what we call a high performance network because it's tied to high performance computers. The users don't think anything about doing a file transfer for a four gigabyte file from Mississippi to, Aber to uh, Maryland. They just do it if they need to do it. If they need to do visualization on their desktop, they might think about downloading anything over two gigabytes. But if it's below that, they'll just go ahead and do it so they can visualize it. This is, they expect 24 seven, high performance, low latency, good service. So we had to maintain that. And we're a DOD network. We do a limited amount of classified processing. So security is very important. What we did as of 2005, entire network, dual stack enabled. Now, that does not mean that every one of the sites connected to DREN was, car was carrying IPv6 traffic, but the entire network did. And we had, initially we had about 12 sites, that's grown to close to 20 now, with some of the user sites have voluntarily come on board. 
and it's continued for the last five years. And we do a lot of peering with other networks. Hurricane Electric has a representative here. We peer with them, Internet 2, dozens of others, um, both nationally and internationally. We did maintain the performance, and we did improve the security level. Now, I cannot say that IPv6 was the reason we were able to improve the security level. That was just passage of time, better tools available. Our, we had a, a more experienced team doing the job. And it's, it, the mindset at the end of 2005 was the goal for DREN was to become a v6 network that was providing legacy support for v4. Now that's history. That's not looking forward. We've very nearly reached that point. Most of our network management is done over v6 today. Uh, yesterday one of the speakers was talking about 6PE and how useful that was in doing v6. Well, that's absolutely true. The, uh, the wide area network is an MPLS network. It doesn't care if it's moving V4 packets or V6 packets or ATM packets, and we move all three today. But um, ever, wherever we can, we turn off V4 and turn on V6. Okay, the third goal was to develop a process that would facilitate deploying V6 at the local infrastructure, because we knew that wide area network isn't all that hard. It's, you've got a very homogeneous structure, centrally controlled, should be fairly easy to enable V6 on it, and, and that proved to be the case. It's when you get down and have to do the hand-to-hand -hand combat in the local infrastructure that you can get into some, some difficult situations. So we developed a process, and we captured metrics from its deployment. How much time did it take? How long? How many hours? How many dollars? To, to do it at each of the sites. And we did it, we didn't do it at all 100 plus sites, we did it at 12 sites, the six supercomputing centers and six user sites that, that either volunteered or in a couple of cases we talked them into it. Now, as of 2005, we were done. We had developed a process, and I'll say more about that later, and we had captured the metrics. And I'll just summarize the metrics here. And I'm not going to say anything about the wide area net network deployment process metrics because I don't think anyone except maybe Martin Levy is, uh, cares about that aspect of it. But we didn't hire any new people, and we haven't since then. It was all part-time assignments, and we haven't dedicated anybody to IPv6 since then. We have an you know, integrated support, operations, um, help desk, everything, it's dual stack support. There's, there's no partitioned structure anywhere in the people. Um, uh, now, a small supercomputer center will have one supercomputer, a uh, handful of high-speed subnets, around maybe 100 people and uh, desktop computers. That, that's fairly small. A large center will have four or more supercomputers, a dozen or so big networks and some small ones, and maybe as many as a thousand desktops and people. So that's the, the range of organizations that we're talking about. And we, as best we could, we tried to keep track of how many hours, man hours, it took to do the deployment. And we didn't believe the numbers. We thought they were too low. So we went back and queried and asked and said, did you consider this? Did you track this? And on and on. And a small site, it was 100 hours, man hours. A large site, it was 600 man hours. And the elapsed time was from six months at the small end to nine months at the large end. And that included, for some of the sites, people training at the beginning and learning about IPv6 to the point where they could work with it. And at the small sites, I mean, one of the sites did it with two part-time people. The larger sites, it was t a team of seven people. And the expenses, and I'll, I'll say more about this also in a moment, um, the only things that happened across all those sites was that two sites each replaced one small router that they were planning to release, replace anyway. Now, this is 2003. We weren't sure what would happen when we went into that. 
because we didn't have an up-to-date inventory, which is one of the things you're supposed to have. Um, looking back on that, what I'd say is that we're probably a statistical anomaly in that regard because our centers, if it's over three and a half years old at the center, it's gone. That, you know, that's, it's, it's fallen off the table and been replaced. So those two routers, they were about due to be replaced anyway. You go, you go into private industry or you go to, into a federal agency, you're gonna, or other parts of DOD, you'll find things that are seven, 10, 12 years old. Now, this is 2010, so um, based on our experience, if you've got something that's less than 10 years old, there's a fairly good chance that it'll be okay for V6 capability, routers and computers. I'm not talking about software applications, but uh, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that back then, if it wasn't high end, lots of V6 was done in software on the network equipment. Well, that's perfectly acceptable if you have um, a work group or if you have, say, 100 gigabit, I'm sorry, 100 megabit or less, uh, that's, that's all the, the speed requirement you're putting on your equipment. We have a 10 gigabit backbone and we're in the midst of a procurement and I don't know what the result will be, but we're, we're feeling cramped right now. And our, our big sites have 2.4 gigabit network connection to the, to the backbone. Um, so, you know, in some respects we're an anomaly, but we've got the same people and we've got the same problems to solve in deploying IPv6 across the sites. So I, I hope that the process that we developed will transfer to private industry, to small business, to uh, commercial practice. And the fourth goal was to enable a core mission application. And we had no idea how this would go, but it's Kerberos, and if you know anything about that, then okay, you know about it. If you don't, it's, it's just a bunch of software that runs in a distributed fashion. It includes one-time authentication. Uh, back in 2003, we were using secure ID cards from Ace something, and um, every user had on their desktop a client kit that they had to use to do their authentication, to do all the remote access, to do their file transfers. They couldn't do it any other way. They had to use Kerberos. And that also meant that we had software on all the central systems that, that did the other piece of the handshake. So by 2005, all this software was IPv6 enabled and deployed and in use. Not very much IPv6 use, but it was enabled and waiting to be used. All the users had V6 enabled clients on their desktops and hardly anybody knew it. It was still doing just V4 because that's the only connectivity there was. Metrics, we didn't capture those for two reasons. One, MIT at just the right time, timing is everything, at just the right time had done most of the work to make Kerberos V6 capable. We did a small amount of extra work for our security requirements we built in the um, DOD common access card so we could have PKI authentication. We started using H tokens, but, but all that work was swamped by all the things that we had to do on a continuing basis to do security updates and rolling out client kits and servers to keep up with the IAVA requirements. So it just wasn't worth trying to track how much time did it take to do the IPv6 enablement. But in preparation for that, and although we didn't do any other application work, we did survey the industry. We did find out what had been done, what were best practices. We recorded those, wrote them down. We've got presentations about that. I'll tell you how to find them later. I'm not going to say anything more about them today. Um, also, notice in, when I started out, I said that 40% of our users were local to the supercomputer centers. Well, what about all those other people? Well, for them, we were one of the early customers of Hexago, which is the previous name for GoGo6. We still have two faithful tunnel brokers running, and I've logged, I was trying to figure out uh, this morning, I think I've logged between five and 6,000 hours on Hexago tunnel brokers because when I work from home, I have to set up 
a V4 tunnel to get to a, a DREN site, and then I run the tunnel broker so that I have secure V6 connectivity. Um, in passing, let me mention VPN because nobody's talked about it before. Up to this date, and I'm, I might be about three months out of date, there may have been some announcement made recently, but up to this date, all the VPN and SSL uh, variants that do tunneling only worry about V4. If you take your Windows 7 or your Mac or your Linux workstation, you go to any hotspot anywhere in the world, you fire it up, you set your tunnel up, anybody who's lurking there who has V6 capability can go straight into your system if you don't have protections in place because the tunneling mechanism is only protecting V4. V6 is left open, word to the wise. Um, okay, um, on an ongoing basis, all the outward facing services that Dale talked about, web, email, uh, network management, time protocol, you name it. We didn't initially get those all turned on and we didn't even get them all turned on in the first year or two years, but by now they're almost all dual stack enabled. One thing that we added in 2009 was Google over IPv6. Uh, there, there have been talk about that yesterday where you just go to Google and if you're a, at a site, which all DRN sites are automatically, on their whitelist, you'll get access to Google over V6 if, if you have connectivity. Um, at one of our sites, and this is a user site, and we don't have metrics for it, but um, it's probably the largest concentration of dual stack equipment on the planet, or at least in the United States. It's got over 200 buildings, it's got 6,000 people, it's got hundreds of subnets, got 10,000 computers of various sizes, 99% dual stack. And when they uh, turned on Google over IPv6, the traffic went from a goodly fraction below 1% to over 10%. And it was Google traffic and, and then YouTube, it spiked up further, I don't know the exact number. But, uh, you know, if you build it and you have uh, resources that they want to get to, they will come. And, and, and very few of the users ever knew that they had transitioned from V4 to V6. Okay, now, uh, that's what we did. Any questions about what we did? Or did I snow you with that sufficiently? Sure. Um, well, when I talk about the process, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, but because of the way we went through the process, the help desk, the operations staff, the databases, those were all transition, transitioned before the deployment was completed. So that when the users started hitting it, the help desk Maybe they didn't have a lot of confidence, but they were at least aware and they'd had some training and they knew what to do if problems came up. And, and uh, I'm trying to remember back. There were some hiccups, but they didn't stand out. I mean, there's, there's always problems on the network, whether it's V4 or V6, and I, I don't remember any wave of problems. Okay, now how we did it. If you get nothing else out of my talk this afternoon, here's one slide that you absolutely have to take with you because it's absolutely golden. I, you can use it in so many ways, not just for V6 deployment. You can use it for what house should you buy, uh, wh when you should change jobs or whatever. Five things you need to have to have a successful change. Vision, incentives, resources, skills, and an action plan. You miss any one of those, you're hurting. You miss two or more, you're really hurting. Uh, just to take uh, number two, for example, if you're missing incentives, you're going to have a gradual change. Well, we certainly know that that's true for IPv6 transition in general. Uh, if you're missing vision, you're gonna have confusion. If you're missing resources, you know how frustrating that is. 
If you're missing skills, you're going to be paralyzed and afraid to do much of anything. And if you're told to do it anyway, that's a, a bad situation. And then if you don't have an action plan, you'll have lots of false starts. And, and uh, now it's time to, oh, all right, those, those five factors DRAN did have, and I'll just quickly do a thumbnail sketch of those. Vision. We wanted to be the DOD IPv6 pilot re leading the way for the rest of DOD. We, we knew from the outset that it was going to be a long, slow process. We didn't know how long or how slow. And we wanted to quickly deploy it across the full infrastructure, not just the network, but the local area net, the computers, the applications, everything. And one thing that was kind of unusual from the community that we came from, we had a commitment throughout the process to capture lessons learned and share them with others. John Curran mentioned yesterday when he was on the panel, I think he said he'd been to, he'd made 61 speeches this year. Was that the right number? Anybody remember? It was 61 or 71. Hmm? 61. Okay. Uh, f for completely unrelated, uh, last week I had to dredge back the last three years of, of how many speeches that DREN team members had made about our deployment experience in various forums, and it was 60-something. I mean, he did it in one year. I, I just shudder to think about that. We had three people spread over three years uh, doing similar things. Incentives. Uh, DREN, or DREN, is part of the Department of Defense. That's a military organization, in case you, that has escaped your notice. When the DOD CIO issued his 2003 memo, one of the first things he did was he looked at DRN and said, hey, how quickly can you make IPv6 happen? So it's a military organization. We jumped, and on the way up, we asked, how high, sir? There, there was no, and, and this is completely untypical, and I realize that, for commercial and for most of the rest of the federal government, but it's the situation we were in, and we had real incentive to, to succeed. Resources. We were very fortunate. I already mentioned that, that most of the, that, that our network and most of the centers had recent homogeneous equipment. The, the people everywhere were good. You know, good people can do great things um, in a short time without resources. Uh, reasonable people can do good things in reasonable time with reasonable resources, but, but we were very fortunate in that regard. Now here's one thing that, that probably was unique for that time. Um, now with the networks contract, it's not unique, but then it was. We had an option in, an ex in the existing contract for running the network that when we asked for it, the vendor would support dual stack operation. I mean, that was very unusual. Skills, we had a community familiar with new technology and we had limited experience with a small test bed V6 test bed from about two years before. Action plan. We didn't want to invent a wheel. We didn't want to reinvent a wheel. We wanted to go out and find a transition process that had been developed and had some maturity and that we could apply to our problem. Um, yesterday, you were talking about change management process. So we, what we found was a technology transition process, but probably fair, fair overlaps to a fair degree. And what we found was something that the Software Engineering Institute had developed. And I have a couple of slides about that. It's the uh, transplant process. And one of the things that it said you should do, and we did, and it worked, and it wasn't at all obvious, is that you really need a bunch of plans. You need one plan for your enterprise. High level, not very thick, focuses on what you're going to do and why you're going to do it but not who, not how, no schedule, just high level sort of vision. Uh, so maybe it's akin to what the, the federal government has uh, done twice in 2005 and then in September um, this year. And, and I won't go through the individual steps, you'll get the slides later, but uh, I, I do need to, to make sure you don't get misled by the similarity of the terms. When it says transition mechanism there, it certainly is not referring to the very specific 
technical transition mechanisms that are part of IPv6. It's focused on the process. How do you make the change in the organization, in the network, in the various pieces of your organization? Not, not down to the bit level, but how the people work together and relate and what or organization and management you need to have in place to do that. And of course, you need to manage the risk, document the plan, and somebody yesterday was talking about how important it is to communicate. That's, communication is critical. We had, um, we had from the DOD CIO to the HPCMP program director, and he trickled that down to all the centers that were gonna be involved. When I, I got to go to each of the centers and explain this next step, which is the lower level action plan that was used at each center to do the transition process, the deployment, I made sure that I always talked to top management first at that location, then middle management, then I talked to the technical people, and it was a different talk in, e in each case. Um, first thing is, and, and we added this step, it wasn't part of the uh, SEI process, learn the te terminology and the technology. Then you establish a change team and do these other steps. Uh, step seven, uh, local test bed. I'll say more about that later, but that's very important in terms of learning and avoiding mistakes in the real world. And then uh, step eight, and, and we thought about this quite a bit, and I've, I've seen it happen elsewhere with other people that have grand plans to deploy IPv6. Avoid grand plans. Pick a location, pick a part of that location. Come up with a plan for that part of that location. Deploy V6. Look at how you did it. Learn from your mistakes. Take that plan, adapt it. Do it on another part of the organization. You know, learn a little, deploy a little, test, learn from your mistakes, and repeat that process until you've got the entire location done. That works very well when you're going, you know, site by site by site, which was once we got down below our wide area net, that was our, our main focus. Okay. Uh, just, this is a restatement in some ways of, of some of the things that I've said before, but people. When you're choosing people to do the deployment, you want people who are interested. Now, they might not necessarily be in your IT department. They may be application developers. They may even be salespeople. I don't care. It's better to have people that are interested in doing it than in people that are being forced to do it. Try to choose the people so that when they're done with their part-time assignment and they go back to the part of the organization that's their full-term career path, that, that their experience will enrich their ability to do their job when they come back rather than detract from it. Training, uh, that's been spoken about enough. The one thing that I'll add on training is people who are interested, and, and somebody mentioned it, oh, uh, talking about the statistics for, uh, for GoGo and uh, the way people were training, a lot of them were doing it at home. People who are interested will read books, they'll do the online webinars, they'll find out how to do it on their own time. But it costs nothing to any organization in your human resources plans for hiring and promotion to include factors for IPv6 knowledge and experience. And, th and that's zero cost, but over time that gives you a resource that you can draw on that if you don't have, you're gonna pay big bucks in short time to get somebody to train your people. Personality, openness to change, vision trickle down, I already talked about that. Process, earlier slides, procurement, don't buy it unless it supports V6. Uh, several other people have said that today. I don't care if you're not going to use V6 for 10 or 15 years. I, I think you're wrong, but if you feel that way, you should still start buying V6 equipment today. It won't cost you any more, and it'll cost you a lot less down the road. Preparation. We had this existing contract use existing contracts that already have that as, as built in, if you can. If you have to develop your own, 
contracts, well, put the clauses in and see who complains and, and score them lower. And the one who says that they'll provide that service at no extra cost, select them. That'll send a message. And practice. Uh, in our case, it was relatively new equipment, but relatively new at this point means, you know, less than 10 years. That's not relatively new. Uh, I already talked about MPLS. I think in all the ways I wanted to. Oh, one of the things in 2003, we weren't sure this would work because we looked around and large-scale deployments of V6 were few and far between, even overseas. So we were very conservative in the profile that we implemented. Words like IPv6 capable and IPv6 enabled and the government profile and the DOD profile, they didn't exist, they hadn't been dreamed of. What we aimed for was functional parity with IPv4. The vendor would say, what, what parts of IPv6 do you want us to support? And we would say, we want to do everything with V6 that we can do today with V4. Don't worry about the RFCs, just show us that you can do today what you can, with 4, do it in 6. And uh, that served us very well. Uh, also, uh, humor me for a moment, I'm going to get on a soapbox here. V4 is not V4 capable. Okay? You show me a box that can do everything that V4 is supposed to be able to do when heavily loaded and under attack, and I'll say that's a wonderful box. Um, we hit boxes in, in DRAN and at our supercomputer sensors harder than most people do. So we see lots of the flaws that other places might not see. But, but it's true that V4 is not V4 capable. So please don't expect V6 to be V6 capable when it's got probably another 10 years of widespread root use to, to reach the same level of maturity that V4 has today. Um, and later, now I realize that the Veterans Administration is taking a different tack, and for their organization, their requirements, that made sense. But in our case, since we're we're an internet service provider and we mainly have to provide our users with rock solid high speed service. We chose this conservative goal. Now sometime later, and later hasn't come yet for us, we'll start worrying about the, you know, the, the, the neat features of IPv6, like mobility, like we care, how mobile are supercomputers, right? But anyway. Okay, that's the end of how we did it. Any questions from anybody? No? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Spa War San Diego. That was the user site that I mentioned that it, it's, it's part of DREN. That was the, the site that was the, you know, the most fully deployed V6 site that I, that I know of with the hundreds of buildings and thousands of people and computers. And perhaps you've seen Ron Brosma. He, he's the most prolific speaker that we have on the DREN team. He, I think in the last year, he's probably given 12 or 15 talks about the Spay War experience. But that's folded into, that's, you know, Um, it was, he's our chief engineer, and I'm the implementation manager. He knows everything. I have to figure out how to get other people to do what he knows how to do. Okay? So, um, but, but I'm the one who, who got to run around to the other sites. I, I, there was no point in talking to San Diego because he ha knew how to do it. But we worked together to come up with the details of the transition of the deployment process, and then I spread the word to all the other sites. So, so it, I mean, it dovetails exactly because it was part of our initial plan and, and deployment. Any other questions? Okay, lessons learned. How am I doing for time?
Um, there's easy parts, and, and some of the, these you might know, some of them may not be obvious, but the wide area network, that was fairly straightforward. Homogeneous, well-controlled piece of cake. The local, the, the lands at the sites, again, that wasn't too bad because, again, they're homogeneous. Now, if you're at a site that has equipment from four or five vendors from multiple years, multiple speeds, multiple uh, protocols, it might be a different story for you. But in our case, that wasn't hard. Um, doing V6 in modern operating systems, piece of cake. It's already mostly enabled by default. And I have to say that XP is not a modern operating system. Okay, if, if, you, if you turn IPv6 on in XP, it supports it real well, but there's some things it just cannot do. So don't expect it to do everything. Establishing basic services, that was easy. And commodity services was easy. For example, uh, websites, uh, stick an application layer gateway in front of a website, and unless you have to worry about distribution of load balancing, it's real easy to, to dual stack a website. More challenging, getting the address plan right. I need to repeat that bullet, so I'll, I'll repeat it in a moment. Be willing to revise your plan until you get it right. Don't just sit down and write one and charge off and try using it. Uh, challenging is operating and debugging a dual stack environment. Multicast, although it's easier than V4 and more functional, is one of the harder things to do. But we've had multicast running for, I think, three years. We peer with Internet 2 so that it's not only internal to DRAN but across networks. Uh, now, going back to the address plan. Uh, well, no. Next slide. I'll say more about that. Hard part, creating and ma maintaining a security infrastructure. You've already got this hopefully carefully crafted security structure for V4. When you overlay on your network another pro protocol suite, please try to reuse as much as you can of what you know well. But if it just won't work, admit it. Don't beat your head against the wall or a dead horse or whatever. So you do have to do some, some thinking, some searching, maybe horrors for a security person, trying some new software to see if it'll support both protocols. But it, it's possible. We did it and ended up with a, a better infrastructure than we had before single stacked. Working around broken or missing functionality, you can do that. You can always find workarounds. The trick is realizing quickly that you need to find a workaround. And, th and that can get hard to, to do sometimes, debugging in a dual stack environment. And this is more something that's been happening lately, getting timely fixes from vendors. Uh, at first, it was real easy. We'd point out a problem to them. They'd say, oh, yeah, we haven't tested that before. We know that's a problem. It's clear. And they'd come back with a fix. Now we're getting to subtle second and third generation problems. We've been beating on the, the uh, equipment in our environment with V6 traffic for several years now. And, and we try something new. We try something different. Something doesn't work. We, we have a bit of a problem. OK. Uh, lessons learned. I'll, I'll try to go th quickly through this. Look at what you currently have and ask yourself, will it be part of the problem or part of the solution? Are your maps and your configs up to date? And, and please don't laugh. This happens, that they're not up to date. Are your current security and network management that you have in place adequate for V4? If they're not, halt, fix it. You try to overlay V6 protocols on a a shaky infrastructure of V4, you're asking for trouble. Think about your D V6 deployment and study the IETF guidance on addressing. They had good reasons. Until you understand those reasons and know enough to understand what you're violating when you do something different, you're at risk if you do something different. I know 64 seems like a huge number just for a device, but there's good reasons for it. And don't forget about your V4 infrastructure. Okay. 
almost done. Um, test programs, wherever possible, get somebody else to do your work for you. There's a number of test programs around now. Make use of them. The Ready logo has been talked about a lot. Go look at those lists. The NIST pr test program. Now, unfortunately, NIST has decided that they're not going to put up a database of all these certificates of com conformity. So you can't just look there. But even if you're in private industry, don't hesitate to ask a vendor, have you done, been through the NIST process? Could I see a sample certificate from you? Just to get assurance that the equipment you want to buy has been tested. And the, the DOD UCR, that's the most stringent. It's, it's short right now. It will be growing. Contracts. Um, Dale talked about the FAR. We haven't said anything about networks here, and if you're not federal, it, it doesn't apply too much, except that the five vendors on that contract, they're on the hook to the federal government to, su to support V6. Special clauses, talked about that. Learn from the experience of others. Uh, North American V6 Task Force has a knowledge base. Aaron has a nice one. Linux has a stellar one if you're doing Linux. Uh, DRAN, we run one. It's HTTPS right now. I've been working for over a year to get the S removed so we'd have public access. The wheels of the government grind slow, but I hope by the end of the year it will be. I think this is my last slide. Yes. Um, experience is the best teacher. Set up a V6 test lab. Uh, it, well, you can do this at home or you can do it at work. Uh, if you only have one computer, you can set up a virtual test lab. Microsoft has a document that tells you how to do it. You need external V6, ipv6.google. For testing, uh, there's, there's three listed there. For connectivity, and, and try this at home, not at work. We already talked about tunnel brokers, but some security officers take a dim view of your punching tunnels through your corporate infrastructure, so, so learn at home. Build a little, test a little, learn a lot. Uh, I'm all done. The last slide, which I won't show you, when you get the slides, you can look at it. It tells you. If, you're, if you want to look at the DRAN knowledge base today before it's public access, send me, uh, it tells what to do to send a request. Just say that you were at the, uh, which con the GoGo Net conference. Any final questions? Am I out of time? Okay, thank you, bye.